Father in heaven, we have gathered in your house today to praise you, to study your word, and to learn more about Jesus, our friend and Savior, and soon to be our coming King. As we open your word now, Lord, we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. This is part number five that we've been studying on the Godhead. There have been a number who have had questions or concerns, maybe even some doubts about the Godhead. Who is Jesus? Did he have a, a beginning? Was there a time when he did not exist? Is the Holy Spirit a person or just God's energy? And so we have devoted a number of weeks to the study of this topic. And again today, we're going to have a large amount of Bible passages on the screen to share with you. Uh, rather than taking notes, if you just want to give me your email address, drop me a, a note, mentonepastor at gmail.com, and I'll be very happy to forward the email file to you. The year was 1876, September 19, and two men were riding on a train. These two men were both Civil War veterans. One had served in the Union Army as a colonel, the other in the Union Army as a general. The man on your left there, his name is Robert Ingersoll. He was a renowned skeptic uh, and avowed agnostic. The man on your right was Lou Wallace. He'd served as a general in the Army, and they were both on their way to a reunion of those who had served during the Civil War time. So they met. And Lou Wallace, the one on your right, considered himself a believer. And he was aware of Robert Ingersoll and his, his uh, positions, his thinking. And so as they met, uh, Lou asked Robert Ingersoll to present to him in his most um, emphatic, logical way his, his reasons for not believing in the Bible, not believing in Christ, and so on. Well, this Robert Ingersoll was more than happy to do because he spent a lot of his time giving lectures, denouncing Christianity and the Bible and belief in Christ. And so he put forth quite an eloquent dissertation and used wit and sarcasm and ridicule to dismantle the belief system in Jesus as the divine Son of God. As part of that talk, he, he said, who, who is this Jesus anyway? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. And then he turned to Governor Wallace and with very intent eye contact said, do you know? And this caught General Wallace by surprise. He had considered himself to be a believer, but having heard what Robert Ingersoll had said, his faith was shaken and he wasn't sure where he stood. But he left there uh, with determination that he would find out. And so he began a very intense period of research and he read everything he could. And after he'd finished, a couple years later, he came away believing more than ever before that Jesus was the divine Son of God. He was reconverted as a result of that. And he put his thoughts together. He said, how, how, what am I going to do with this research that I've come up with now? What should I do with it? And so he decided that he would write a book. And this would be his answer to the challenges and the charges that... Uh, the skeptic, the agnostic Robert Ingersoll, had presented it. So he wrote a book in, in the year 1880. It was published, and uh, maybe you've heard of it. Whoops, it went by so fast. There it is. The book that he wrote was Ben-Hur. His response to the questions about who is the Christ. So each one of us faces those questions. Who is Jesus? Who is, who is he? Is the Lord of the universe? Is, the, is he the Lord of my life? of the even more important questions. So we've been thinking about the Godhead and Christ's part, role within that. We're going to review just very, very quickly some of these previous slides because God is so immense, how could he relate to his creatures? Well, uh, God the Father assumed the role of chief administer, administrator. God the Son assumed the role of being the one to interact with the creatures, angels, and then later human beings. God the Spirit working behind the scenes, silently invisible. But we should never lose sight of the fact that they are all, they all share the complete attributes of divinity. And because of this, the titles that the Bible uses are used, shall we say, interchangeably. And context will sometimes help as to whether it's speaking more directly of God the Father, or God the Son, or God the Spirit. But we... 
we must say that any, any teaching, any concept that demotes Jesus from being part of the Godhead, from having all of the attributes and authority of the Godhead, we are, we are very uncomfortable with that. And why? Because Jesus has to be divine in order for the system of, of justice to balance. It was a divine law that was broken. And only a divine, divine sacrifice could atone. So we want to keep that in mind always as we go through our study. Here's a, the way one Bible translation translates John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, what does it say there? It says a God. I'm disappointed and I'm saddened by that translation because I believe the Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus is not a God with a small g. Jesus is not a partial or a semi-God. Jesus is fully and completely God, without qualification. Now it is true that he subordinated himself voluntarily in order to accomplish salvation, and he became a human. But that should never lead us to believe that in any way he is not completely God. How have we done our study? We've gone to the Bible and we've looked at the, the passages that are unmistakable and unambiguous on this topic. Then later, next week to be specific, we'll take up some of the passages that at first glance might seem to suggest something different. And we'll discuss those passages next Sabbath. We'll keep in mind, though, that this is uh, something that is not new with respect to any Bible subject. There are texts that pose challenges, as Peter said in that, in that verse. So we looked, we've been looking at the testimony of six different witnesses as to the divinity of Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter, John, Thomas, Isaiah, and today we're going to talk about what Jesus had to say himself. These are some of the passages that Paul wrote about the divinity of Jesus. And in, in those he quoted from the Old Testament, he was not uncomfortable or hesitant whatsoever to understand that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He is the Yahweh, the Jehovah, the Lord with all capital letters that the Bible speaks about. Jesus is worshipped, something that pertains only to, de to deity. He quoted from Isaiah 45, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we took a look even at the passage that uh, he quoted from there in Isaiah 45, and he used the exact same words in the Greek, New Test the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint in order to bolster his argument that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He is fully equal to God the Father. We took a look at what Peter had to say about this subject. And we noted that in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, he quoted from the book of Joel and said, It will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as he did so, uh, from thereafter, he makes it very, very clear that the name specifically that he's talking about when he refers to the gospel, to the prophecy of Joel, is Jesus Christ. He is the one whose name we rely on for salvation. In his letter, he wrote about the faith uh, with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, the form of the construction there makes it clear that God and Savior are both talking about one person, and that is Jesus. What did John say about the deity of Christ? Well, wow, we went very fast there, didn't we? Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Let's go back and take a quick look. I didn't touch anything. Well, let's pick it up from here. Thomas's testimony. Thomas was a doubter at first. And then Jesus invited him to touch the nail prints, put his hand in the side where the sword went. And after that, what did Thomas say? He said, my Lord and my God. Notice very carefully that Jesus did not correct him. He did not say, uh, no, Thomas, you don't have that exactly right. I'm not really Lord and God. No, Jesus accepted it because it was true. And when, Je when he said that, uh, Jesus responded, Thomas, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And we ask the question, believe what? Well, believe that somebody had come from the grave for sure, but not merely that, but to believe that indeed Jesus is Lord and God. That was part of Thomas's confession. And Jesus said, blessed are those who, not having seen, believe. And then we took a quick look at the, at the writings of Isaiah. And we found that in chapter 6, there it is. The, uh, the, the, the vision of the Lord's glory, which in John chapter 12 is applied to Jesus. Isaiah chapter 7, 
the prophecy of Emmanuel, God with us, fulfilled with Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Isaiah 9, verse 6, again, talking about the son that was to be born, who is the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. And repeatedly, how many times the Lord is called the Redeemer, which of course is a title that belongs especially to Jesus. All the members of the Godhead are involved in salvation, but how could we deny that Jesus is the one that is most directly involved by coming to this earth and living and dying for our sins? So let's take a look at what Jesus' testimony is himself. We're going to begin in the book of John. In fact, most of our, our work is going to be in the gospel of John. Chapter 5, if you have your Bible there, it tells a story about a man who was a paralytic. And this man had positioned himself by the pool of Siloam because it was understood. There was a rumor that went out that said that if the waters of the pool of Siloam are agitated, if they're troubled a little bit, then whoever jumps into the pool first will be healed. And so this man had been waiting patiently all those years to see the water disturbed and then to be able to be the first in. But then one day he notices somebody comes up to him, a stranger he doesn't recognize, and the stranger says, do you want to be healed? And the man says, yes, I'd love to be healed, but every time the water shakes a little bit, somebody beats me in. And then Jesus turned to him and says, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately that man felt strength in his muscles that he'd never felt before. And he rose to his feet and with joy in his heart, he, he praised the Lord. But you know what? His praise was criticized by the Jews. Because they said, how is it that, that, that you were healed? How is it that you're carrying that bed on your, on your shoulder? Now, mind you, the, what, what is called a bed uh, in that passage was probably nothing more than a, a mat that he would have rolled up. But from the Jews' point of view, that was work. That was carrying a burden. That was breaking the Sabbath. And so they criticized him. And they said, who is it that told you to carry your bed on the Sabbath and break the Sabbath? And the man said, I don't know, but of course later uh, it was Jesus that did it. So we're reading in John chapter 5 now the conversation that takes place between Jesus and the Jewish leaders concerning this, this matter. And Jesus answered them and said, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only, you know, we would put quotation marks around the, the next words, wouldn't we? Not only he broke the Sabbath. Did Jesus break the Sabbath, yes or no? No, he did not. He said it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. But from their point of view, because Satan had inspired them to put all this, all this mountain of regulations that obscured the beauty of the Sabbath, from their point of view, he had broken the Sabbath by carrying his mat. Not only did he broke the Sabbath, but also he said, no, it's very careful here. Not only he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, those are very, very important words in, in our discussion. We learn from this passage that the, that the Jews understood that Jesus claimed equality with God. But there's another point that we need to look at very, very carefully. The Jews understood that by implying that he was the son of God, that that meant that he was not inferior to, but that he was equal with God. Do you see the importance of that Understanding there? The reason I bring that up is because next week when we talk about the terms that are used regarding Jesus, that uh, some people wonder ex exactly what that means. One of them is the Son of God. And it's true that from maybe an earthly point of view, if we think of Father and Son, we might think of Father as being superior, older, wiser, whatever, stronger, and Son being inferior. But that is not fair. That we, that we found in Philippians 2 verse 6 where it says that Jesus did not consider it robbery or a thing to be grasped at, to be equal with God. Very same word. In John 5, as the passage unfolds a little more, we find that there are three statements of comparison, and they demonstrate very clearly the equality of the Father and the Son. Now, they're two different beings. They're two distinct beings, but nevertheless, they share the same qualities and attributes and powers that belong to deity, to the Godhead. So they are equal, we find in this passage, they are equal with respect to their work and activity. Secondly, in the capacity to give life, which I'm going to propose to you is something that belongs only to God. Only God can give life. And thirdly, they are equal in, their, in the way that they execute judgment and receive honor. So let's read the verses here and see how that's brought out. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, 
The son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son does all, do, also does in like manner. So they share a commonality in their work and activity. Whatever the father does, the son does. There is an equivalency there. As the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whomever he will. They share the capacity to be able to give life. Only God can do that. And this does not refer to a partial God or a semi-God or a God with a small g. It is the very God himself. And Jesus has those capabilities. They share them in common. He shares them in common with the Father. Then thirdly, he says, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whatever honor is due to the Father is also due to the Son. That's a sharing, that's an equality that the passage is bringing out. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So in the fifth chapter of John, we are, we are uh, educated very clearly with regard to the equality of Jesus in respect with the Father. We come to the eighth chapter of John, and this has one of the most potent verses in all the Bible to underscore the divinity of Jesus. Uh, read the whole chapter. We're not going to take time to do it, but it involves another discussion between the Jewish leaders and Jesus, and the subject of, of parentage comes up, and uh, along the way, Jesus says to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, what's the tense of that verb? Was is what? Past tense, right? Before Abraham was, then what? I am. What's the tense there? It's present tense, isn't it? Then, notice the reaction, they took up stones to throw at him. Why did they do that? Because in the Jewish way of thinking, anybody who claimed to be God was, was committing blasphemy. Now, they were correct in their understanding as far as what constitutes blasphemy, but they were far short with, uh, with regard to the idea that Jesus Christ was God on earth. He was Emmanuel, God with us. In that, they were mistaken. But let's think about this, this uh title that is used here, and look at it very, very carefully. I say to you before Abraham was, I am. I am uh, means the one who is, the one who is self-existent. It's derived from the Hebrew verb to be. And it corresponds with what we read in John chapter 1 verse 4 when it says, in him was life. Part of the attributes of the deity is that they, are, they, they have life within themselves, which is something that we cannot say. Now, we are alive. We are alive by the grace of God. Life to us is a gift that is lent. But that is not true with, with respect to deity. With respect to deity, life is an inherent uh, quality that, that uh, pertains to each member of the Godhead. In him was life. He is the first and the last, of course, the Alpha and the Omega, and those are quotations from the book of Isaiah that pertain to the Lord. To be the self-existent one, to be the I am, is, is to suggest that he is the one who causes to be, which is a reference to the fact that Jesus is the creator. I am. To any Jewish person acquainted with the scriptures, their mind would go directly to the story in Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, we have the story of Moses. He's out tending the sheep in Midian of his father-in-law Jethro, and he's, he's uh, um, curious all of a sudden because there's a bush that is in flames, but it's not burning up. And this goes against all the science that he learned from his teachers back in Egypt. How can this bush be burning and not, not be consumed? So he approached the, the, the bush, and a voice came from the bush. And it was the voice of the Lord. And it said, I'm going to send you to Egypt, and you're going to deliver my people. And Moses said, Whom shall I say is, send, is the one who is sending me? And the voice came back, Tell them I am is sending you. So for any Jewish mind, for Jesus to say, Before Abraham was, I am their mind would immediately go back to the story of the burning bush. And if their minds were open and softened by the Holy Spirit, they would come to the conviction that the person that was speaking to them is the same person that spoke from that bush. Jesus is claiming to be the God of the Exodus and all the Old Testament. He's claiming to be the I Am, the great Jehovah. Now that term uh, is found about 4,000 times in the Old Testament. 
And it's printed as uh, Lord or God with all capital letters. So whatever you're reading in the Old Testament and you come upon the name of the Lord or the name of God, and it's in all capital letters, just understand that it is Jehovah, we might say. But when I say Jehovah, I'm going to qualify that a little bit because our language has a J sound in it, and most other languages don't. Hebrew does not have a hard J sound like that. So probably it's more correct to think of it as being Yahweh or Yahweh. Uh, but it is God's personal name. When I say that, I, I want to explain that there are other names in the Bible that are translated Lord or God. Elohim, Adonai, Baal. But they can sometimes be used of earthly rulers or heathen deities. Yahweh, no. Never is used to, any, to refer to any pagan deity or earthly ruler. It's God's personal name. And Jesus claimed to be the I am, the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Go on to John chapter 10. My, I and my father are one. Notice the reaction again. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you for my father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered and said, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, Make yourself God. Now, again, notice that Jesus did not say, oh, no, you misunderstood. That's not really what I'm saying. No, he did not back away from it at all. They were correct to understand that that would be blasphemy for a man to claim to be God. Would be blasphemy. But they were not correct in that they did not recognize that Jesus Christ was God. They had the prophecies. They had the testimony of the works that he had done. But their eyes were closed and blinded because Satan did not want them to recognize Jesus for who he was. Think of the mystery of the supreme sovereign of the universe becoming a man and walking on earth. And then giving his life. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Because he loved us. And wanted to save us. Now we come to the time when Jesus' walk on earth is almost over. It's only a few days before he will be put on the cross and die. So after having walked with Jesus for about three years or so, one of the disciples, Philip, had this question. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. You see, Philip had this idea that was common back then that, well, you know, God may be up there and he's hard to get along with. He's stern. Uh, but Jesus, I see you and you're kind and, and uh, you perform miracles to help us. And, but, uh, but I see a difference between the two. Do you know that a lot of people have that idea today? A lot of people think that, well, God the Father, he's, he's difficult, he's stern, but Jesus, well, he's, he's, he's kind, he's different. That is an incorrect idea. We should ask God to erase that from our mind. And Jesus made that clear. He said, have I, not been, have, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Phil? Know what he says then. He who has seen me has seen the Father. This is a statement again of, Precise, accurate equality. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Philip. It's also a statement that should give us very good, very strong encouragement. Because whatever our impression might be of God the Father, as we look at Jesus, we know that this, is a, this person is a Savior and friend. Now, whatever problems we may be experiencing in our life, Jesus understands because he lived on this planet. And he knows what all those things are like. 18th chapter of John. Now it's Thursday evening and Jesus is about to be arrested. And the mob comes out there to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus had been praying. They're led by one of the twelve, Judas. Imagine it. One of the twelve is going to be the one to plant the betrayer's kiss on the cheek of Jesus. So when they come out, Jesus, it says, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, he went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Now notice how the word he is printed here on the screen. And if you look in your Bible, you're going to find it's printed the same way, in italics. What does it mean in the Bible when something is printed in italics? It means that the translators, the printers have supplied that. It wasn't part of the original text, but they felt that the uh, sentence would flow better if they put it in. And so they added the word he there. In many, many cases, maybe even almost all cases, uh, we would find that there's suggestions by the words in italics uh, do make sense and contribute. But there are times when I would say, 
you know what, it would be better if they just left it out. And I would say that this is one of the times. It would be better if it was just left out. Jesus said to them, I am. Now, we know that that had special significance because of what happened afterward. Jesus said to them, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, then, then it says, then when he said to them, I am, what happened? They drew back and fell to the ground. Something happened there when he said, I am. Now, in the book Desire of Ages, Sister White says that when he said, I am, divinity flashed through humanity. Now, when Jesus was on this earth, his humanity, his divinity was veiled. In the incarnation, he did not come here as God Almighty. He did not come in the full expression of his majesty and, and glory, or we would not have been able to live in his presence. And so it was covered. But there were times, and this is one of them, there were times when, on special occasions, divinity flashed through humanity. And the reaction of the people there shows us exactly what that meant. They fell back as dead. Now, sad to say, they recovered and continued with their arrest and trial and mockery and crucifixion. But for a moment there, they, were, they understood they were in the presence of someone supernatural when Jesus said, I am. When we think about that phrase, I am, our minds naturally want to have something to finish that out. I am what? And in the book of John, we are given seven answers to complete the sentence. In the book of John, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, and the true vine. All of these are expressions that come after the, the verb, I am. We want to take a little closer look at, at these, and we're going to find that in each case, we find that the context supports the idea that Jesus is the source of life. Life is the key word that goes along with all those expressions. Each of these illustrations has to do with life, something only God can give. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, look what he says. The bread of life, the, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives what? Gives life to the world. That is something that only God can do to give life. What about the next one? The light of the world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The door. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So in every single one of these cases, the idea of Jesus, the I am, attached to one of these illustrations, is in the context or in support of his giving life to us. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And, of course, the next two expressions, I am the resurrection and the life, spoken uh, within the story about the resurrection of Lazarus. And you remember that story. The two sisters were so discouraged that they had given message that, that the one whom Jesus loved, Lazarus, was sick. Did he come immediately? No. He delayed two more days. When he had come finally, Lazarus had been dead four days. But Jesus had a word of encouragement for them. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he gave evidence for it that day when he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had been dead four days came out of that grave. And one day soon, Jesus is going to come in the sky and he is going to say, come forth to all those that sleep in the dust. And he will be the resurrection and the life in a way that is even greater than he was that day. Lazarus was raised to life, but then he passed away again. But when Jesus comes back and becomes the resurrection and the life for those that we've laid to rest, it will be in a way that life will never be interrupted again. Can you say praise God for that? Have you lost somebody? Have you laid a loved one to rest? Yes, we all have. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That is something that only God can do to bring life. Then we come to the next one that's emphatic as well. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then the last one, the seventh one, the true vine, it's not expressed in an explicit way, but it is implicit because we know that the, if the branch becomes severed from the vine, then it dies, it withers away. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me, that is the source of life, neither can you unless you abide in me. So we have these beautiful seven expressions, I am, Jesus is the I am, the I am who is the bread of life and 
on down the list, all pertaining to how he gives us life, which is something that only God can do. Now, a word about the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is different than the other three Gospels. It was written toward the close of the first century and uh, maybe 30 years or so after the other Gospels were penned. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very, very similar amongst themselves, so much that those that have studied these things have come up with a word to describe that. They call, them the, they call these Gospels the synoptic Gospels. Optic has to do with what you see, right? Optic nerve. And sin has to do with same or with, and so this means the same view. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very, very similar in their presentation of Jesus and the gospel story. John has a few things that also uh, you can find in the other ones, but there are many things in John that you don't find in the other three. It's almost as if, I imagine it this way anyway, that as John, remember he was the last disciple to be alive. They tried to kill him. They put him in a vat of boiling oil, but God preserved his life. And years later, it was as if being aware of what Matthew had said and what Mark had said and what Luke had said. It's almost as if said John, that John might have said or the Holy Spirit might have impressed him to think this way. That, yes, that's, that's a beautiful story, Matthew. And yes, Luke, yeah, that really happened. But you know what? Nobody, nobody mentioned this. And what about this story? So John adds some pieces that are not found in the other three Gospels. And one unique thing about John's Gospel is the way that he uplifts the divinity of Jesus. He uplifts the divinity of Jesus. John's Gospel is different. It is in the Gospel of John, which we have just taken a look at four or five passages there. In John, we find the clearest and most emphatic statements affirming the full deity of Jesus. I want you to see, see this in a particular context now. The other Gospels don't deny Jesus' deity, but John's is the most explicit and his came later. Does that make sense to you? Makes sense to me. Now, with that in mind... Here's another little comparison. Compare the material written by Ellen G. White. Her earlier writings do not deny the full deity of Jesus, but it is true that her later writings, especially The Desire of Ages and, and after that, affirm his deity in a more explicit way. Now, some people, some people criticize that idea, and they, they, um, they're, they're challenged by that fact that Earlier on, it seems to be different. But if we, if we wonder about that, let us make the comparison that the first three Gospels don't deny Jesus' deity, but it is without question that John's Gospel, written later, is the one that is more emphatic and explicit. It's in the book of Desire of Ages, and we read this statement, that in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, and underived. He is completely and fully God, without beginning. Now, in this book that uh, I may have mentioned earlier, by the way, we, we had a few copies at early service. I don't know if they're all gone, but Doug Batchelor's book uh, is very helpful. It's not very long. And this is another book called, entitled The Trinity that deals with these subjects some, in some depth, I might say. Uh, but uh, we appreciate the work that has gone into these, these books. It's in this book here that I've uh, gleaned a couple of things. And uh, we're look, going to look here at four different classifications that are in common between the Father and Son to lead us to the conviction that they are equal in power and authority. Different qualities, different descriptions, different activities, and different attitudes of Bible writers toward them. But within these four sets, we find that there's commonality between what is said about the Father and the Son. We're not going to look up the verses. Uh, ask me for the PowerPoint file, and you'll have the verses there, and you, you can look them up. But we find that having to do with the qualities attributed to God in the Old Testament, that the New Testament applies those to Jesus. In the Old Testament, God is the sanctifier, Exodus 31. In the New Testament, Jesus is the sanctifier, 1 Corinthians. In the Old Testament, God is the one who brings us peace. In Ephesians, Christ is our peace. God is our righteousness, Jeremiah 23. 1 Corinthians 1.30, Christ is our righteousness. So here we have qualities that are attributed to both to God and Jesus that lead us to believe that, that they share them in common, that, that Jesus is equal to the Father. Ascriptions of God and Christ. The Bible talks about the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ. The Bible talks about the power of God and the power of Christ. The peace of God, the peace of Christ. The church of God, the church of Christ. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of God 
of Christ. So in all these aspects, there is commonality, which leads us to believe that they share them equally. Activities of the Father and the Son, the grace of God that brings us salvation in Galatians, and then the grace of Christ, the salvation of God in Titus, the salvation of Christ in 1 Thessalonians, the forgiveness of God and the forgiveness of Christ, and revelation, that is the giving of visions and prophecy in the writing of the scripture, derives from God and it derives from Christ. And then fourth in this little study, we find that the attitudes of Bible writers toward the Father and the Son are, are the same. Paul speaks about his boast in God, and then he speaks about his boast in Christ. He encourages to have faith in God and faith in Christ. So there is plenty of evidence to support the idea that Christ and God share these things in common. Some other Bible evidence for Christ's pre-existence and eternal nature. We have the beautiful verse in Micah 5 verse 2. You, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall, shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And of course, that's speaking about Jesus Christ, from everlasting. In the book of Hebrews, Paul is drawing uh, drawing a comparison. He's, he's studying a type of Christ in the story of Melchizedek. And what he says here, as, he, as pertains to Jesus, he says, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now, where does he get that idea from Melchizedek? Melchizedek was a human being. But as you read Genesis 14, uh, Paul extrapolates some lessons from that. First, he says, look at his name, Melchizedek. That's telling us about Jesus, the king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. And where did he serve? He was king of Salem. Well, that means he's the king of peace because that's what Salem means. Later became Jerusalem. Well, this is, a, this is telling us about Jesus. He's using Melchizedek as a symbol or a type of Jesus. And then since in Genesis 14, there is no record of Melchizedek's birth or his death or who his parents were. Paul uses him as an illustration of Jesus' divinity and says, with respect to that, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Did Paul believe that, that Christ had an eternal preexistence? Absolutely he did. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. And Isaiah chapter 43, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Jesus has existed from eternity all along. So as we draw our study today to a, a conclusion, I would say this. Our faith is in Jesus, the everlasting, the eternal God, the great I Am, the Jehovah of the Old Testament, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. It is in His divine atoning blood that we trust for our salvation. Can you say amen to that? There may be people among us here who are suffering from one trial or affliction or another. I want to tell you that Jesus is your friend. He was on this planet. He has experienced life and whatever it is that the trial that has brought sadness to your heart, whether you've lost one through, through death, uh, through uh, betrayal or separation, or you're having issues with, with physical health, Jesus is your friend. He is the almighty God. He is the king. He has answers and solutions that we're not aware of if we will just put our trust in him. But we see that out in the world today, there's a lot of people that don't want to look to Jesus for the answers. They're looking everywhere else. And here's a person who had a different idea. What do you think about that for your license plate? I believe in me. I don't know who this person is. and Maybe he has a, a different concept of what that license plate might say. But from my point of view, I can't, I, that's not my confession. I don't believe in me. I believe in Jesus. Jesus is my salvation. And his atoning blood is sufficient for my sins and the sins of the whole world. For your sins. So we agree with what Paul said when he spoke to the jailer and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. May God bless us to that end, to pull our full weight of trust in Jesus as our Savior. Because someday soon, as we see the signs around us, crying out to us that the end is near, this terrible earthquake and tsunami, I read somewhere that that wave was 18 feet tall and was traveling 500 miles an hour. It's a destructive wave. 
And we see the signs about us that are telling us that the end is near. Now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. If you have not come to the point where you are ready to commit your life to Jesus, I invite you to do that today. As we sing our closing song, as we have our final prayer, just say, Lord, I want to open my heart to you. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Give me the peace to know my sins are forgiven and that my hope is secure.